And so we can see immediately that if somebody is suffering with insomnia or recurring nightmares and they've got negative emotions carrying over from the previous day and they're finding it more difficult to manage those negative feelings and negative emotions because the thinking parts of the brain are weakened by not having enough REM sleep to calm them down as well then that makes impulsivity more likely and that's what the research shows adolescents and teenagers adults too but adolescents and teenagers that don't get enough REM sleep they're more impulsive the next day so they're more likely to engage in risk-taking behavior Hello and welcome to another HG podcast. I'm Jay Baker and I'm part of the HG team. Today I'm going to be talking to Ezra Hewing about how too little REM sleep can contribute to suicidal thoughts, self-harm and anxiety. Ezra is a human givens practitioner and also the head of mental health education at Suffolk Mind. Over a number of years Ezra has trained mental health practitioners, doctors, nurses, emergency service workers and also heads of organisation and many others beside in how best to really understand and to help support people with diverse mental health concerns. He holds a Master's in Psychology and Neuroscience of Mental Health from the internationally renowned Institute of Psychology, Psychiatry and Neuroscience at King's College in London through which he's carried out research that's resulted in an explanatory model for the causes of the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Hello, Ezra. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Joe. I'm really looking forward to unpacking this important topic today. Um, absolutely fascinated by sleep myself and, and the REM state. So should we begin by setting the scene and giving a bit of background information to, to actually what is REM sleep and what actually happens in REM and, and why is that so important to our mental health and emotional well-being? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a, a, a great place to start. OK, so if we're thinking about sleep in general broadly speaking there, there are two different kinds now they're deep sleep which is involved in repairing the body and if we had you know if we've got for the neuroscientists out there listening or, or sleep researchers picking holes in that there are descending stages of sleep and it's deep deep sleep stage four where the brain brain waves are, are at their, oscillating at their slowest they're moving at their slowest and that's involved with things like repairing the body and memory consolidation in other words forming and protecting memories from from the waking day and then there's REM sleep um, famously discovered in 1953 by uh, two sleep researchers Asarinsky and Kleitman and it's called that because you see rapid eye movement so you know when your dog or your cat is dreaming because you'll see their eyes flicker but you also see kind of minor muscle movements during REM sleep the major muscle groups are locked and it's thought that that's to stop us from acting out our dreams. Now, in a healthy sleep cycle, however long that is, for, for most people, it's probably around about seven and a half hours, but it can vary just as height and, and weight and body shape can vary. The pattern of sleep can vary from individual to individual too. In what, what you'll see is, is that deep sleep is front loaded. So you have more of your deep sleep in the first half of the night with intervals of REM sleep approximately every every 90 minutes or so and then in the second half of the night increasing stage uh, increasing number episodes of REM sleep leading up to when we wake up and it's during REM sleep that most dreaming occurs there's evidence that we also dream in between deep sleep and REM sleep and sometimes in deeper stages of sleep but those dreams tend to be less less complex in nature whereas the dreams that we have during REM sleep are more metaphorically complex their emotional content matches the emotional content of the day. So, Joe, you, I know that you know this, and many of your listeners will know this, that at the core of uh, the human givens approach is the expectation fulfillment theory of dreaming, which is Joe Griffin's uh, hypothesis supported by the research he was drawing upon at the time, but also research which, which has emerged since he first proposed that theory. And that is the theory that our waking concerns come with a degree of emotional arousal. And if we don't resolve those issues, whatever they are, during the waking phase, then REM sleep performs a really important function of calming our brains down by acting out those expectations metaphorically when we dream. 
And so REM sleep has a really important role in protecting our emotional well-being and mental health by discharging emotions in the previous day. Is that enough to get us started? Yeah, yeah that's, that's really, really helpful. So how does that impact then? Why is that so important for mm. our emotional and mental well-being? Mm. Mm. What the research shows is that if we don't get enough REM sleep, then there are four things that happen, really. One thing is negative emotions from the previous day carry over into the next day. And that affects our our well-being, also our ability to think and plan and resolve problems and get needs met. And then the other thing that happens is that the the amygdalas in the brain, uh, the brain security officers, are super sensitive to events the next day if we haven't had enough REM sleep. So if you if you look at research from clinical settings where they deprive people of REM sleep completely by waking them up when their brain scans show that they're going into REM sleep and they prevent REM sleep from doing the job of clearing away emotions from the previous day and not nasty cortisol, stress hormones, or, or at least excessive cortisol, then the uh, security officers are 60% more reactive to emotionally charged events the next day. So in other words, whereas if we've had a decent amount of sleep and we've had REM sleep, we're able to handle challenges which arise in our day-to-day life. But if we're deprived of REM sleep, then it's more difficult to handle those challenges because the brain security officer is more likely to fire off or overreact and is more sensitive to emotionally charged events. So that's the second thing. The third thing is, is that the, the thinking parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, and in particular, the medial prefrontal cortex, if you, they're kind of so if you think of like, if, you put your, if you're listening to this, if you put your hand on your forehead, um, just behind your forehead, if you think of that as your thinking brain, that's kind of exercising a degree of control over emotional responses and putting the brakes on before we say or do something inappropriate, it's less able to manage the security officer if we're deprived of REM sleep. And then the fourth thing that happens is that if we're deprived of REM sleep over a period of time, say five days or something like that, then there's a rebound in the amount of REM sleep that we have. So we'll have more than you would otherwise have in a healthy sleep cycle. And as many of your listeners will know, an increase in REM sleep is associated with depression, with waking up the next day feeling exhausted, lacking in motivation and unable to focus on addressing unmet needs and just getting out of bed to get to work on time or, you know, feed yourself, brush your teeth, look after your kids, whatever it is that you need to do, because dreaming is, it burns off lots of energy. If we're doing too much, we have too much REM sleep, we're doing too much dreaming, then it's exhausting for the brain. So those, those, that's in a clinical setting. Now, of course, in, in real life, we're not going to be completely deprived of REM sleep. We'll have some REM sleep, but nonetheless, if we're not getting enough REM sleep, perhaps because we're ruminating lots before when we get into bed and we're laying awake for a long period of time, or if we're waking up in the middle of the night with concerns from the previous day or worrying about the next day, and especially if we're suffering with reoccurring nightmares, then those things prevent us from getting enough REM sleep. And the consequences of that are, as I've described, Mm. negative emotions being carried over from the previous day, difficulty with managing emotions and the risk of a a REM sleep rebound if that continues over a period of time. That's really interesting. So it seems that, you know, too much REM is is damaging for us and too little REM is equally damaging for us. Exactly that. Exactly that, Joe. What's the right amount of REM and does that change Mm. over time? Does that does that change as we get older? Yeah. So again, it varies from person to person, but in a healthy sleep cycle, it's something like 18 to 22% of the night. So if we're thinking about that in terms of time over seven and a half hours, that's around about an hour and a half. And again, broken down into kind of episodes with most of them occurring in the, in the second half of the night. Yeah. And it does change over time. As you say, is it would seem that as we get older, we have less sleep in general. So, you know, if we're thinking about people perhaps in their sixties or 70s and they may have six six and a half hours sleep a night and they seem to have less REM sleep whether that's something to do with the aging brain or maybe we're just so super wise that nothing takes us by surprise anymore so we don't have any unmet expectations it seems on I don't think the researchers are quite sure but it does it does change over time the other important thing to say is that during adolescence there's an increase in the amount of time that adolescents will spend sleeping. So teenagers will need, you know, 10 hours sleep plus. And 
as uh, as many people will know if they've tried to get their teenagers to go to bed at a reasonable time and get up the next day they want to their, their rhythm their sleep rhythm what researchers call a circadian rhythm changes so melatonin is released later so they may not feel like going to sleep until 11 or 12 at night and then the withdrawal of melatonin and the increase in cortisol that will encourage them to get get up and get moving that doesn't really kick in until eight nine the next morning so they'll they'll find it more difficult to get up now that's important because that increase in the amount of sleep is to increase the amount of deep sleep that teenagers and adolescents have and they need that to do three things they need it to clear away pathways that aren't needed anymore they need it to make brain cells bigger and then they need it to strengthen the remaining connections so if that's interrupted by insomnia or nightmares or if it's interrupted by having too much REM sleep because they're suffering with depression at an early age, then it interrupts and prevents deep sleep from doing all of that important developmental work in the brain. Mm-hmm. It's it's interesting. I've got two teenage daughters and um, they're pretty good at going to bed. You know, they've they've lived with a mother who bangs on about sleep um, all their lives. Um, so they're, they're pretty good with that. But, you know, they're, they're constantly, bef- you know, and I can't get them to stop mm-hmm. constantly on their phones before they go to bed does that have an impact on REM and the way the the sleep architecture plays out it would seem so I think there are probably there are likely a number of effects of of you know looking at screens or you know scrolling or playing computer games and what have you which researchers are still built building evidence around and some of them are to do with the sort of addictive nature and difficulty with difficulty with social interaction and what have you But it it would seem that I'm sure many people have heard this. I won't be saying anything particularly new, but the blue light from screens prevents the release of melatonin that triggers the onset of sleep. So that certainly interferes with sleep architecture, whether or not it has an impact on REM sleep. I, I don't know that we know that just yet and I guess we're finding out new new stuff every day aren't we it's an ever-evolving you know science and knowledge and learning so what do we really see you know we're here today really to talk about the real impact of too little REM so what yes. kinds of things do you see when somebody is is not having enough REM and why might they not be having enough REM mm-hmm. so if we if we think about why they might not be having enough REM to begin with really the two major kind of sleep disorders that prevent people from getting enough REM sleep are insomnia and reoccurring nightmares. And with insomnia, it can tend to take three forms. The first form can be laying awake for long periods of time, ruminating and unable to go off to sleep. And then the second form is difficulty with uh, staying asleep. So they may be waking up from, particularly if they're having dreams where the level of emotional arousal is very intense and the the dreaming process, the emotional content of the dreams wakes them up. And then the third kind of insomnia is waking up early and then not being able to go back off to sleep. So, and it's the first two kinds in particular, which seem to, which seem to be the, where the most risk is, is concerned that I'll move on to in a moment. So that's difficulty with going to sleep. So people are laying awake, ruminating, which as we know, increases the demand for REM sleep, but then they're not getting enough overall. And so that results in the, in, you know, the negative emotions being carried over that I talked about before and also uh, difficulty with managing emotions the next day and the risk of rebound. And um, the same is true of, of waking up in the middle of the, the night as well. That's like, it, it seems that there's less risk associated with waking up in the early hours of the morning and then laying awake for a while. And I'm not, they don't quite know why that is, but it's the first two. That, that present the most risk and then the other form of disruption is is the reoccurring nightmares why why would that present a risk why would that be a problem well um if you look at if we start with severe depression for example so depression that's lasted for a longer period of time and where the symptoms are, are very serious and by a longer period of time i mean more than say three four six months something like that some, something a depression that a person's been suffering with and struggling with for years in some cases and also if we think about post-traumatic stress disorder and we know that with post-traumatic stress disorder one of the the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder is reoccurring nightmares which likely occur because the brain is trying to discharge the emotional arousal that comes with intrusive thoughts memories and flashbacks of the original event or events that gave rise to post-traumatic stress disorder and What the research shows is that where 
while with depression, you would expect the increase in REM sleep happening earlier on and then people waking up feeling exhausted the next day. For some people who have all of those symptoms, they'll have periods of time where they're suffering with insomnia. And where they are, the negative emotions that carry over from the, to, the previous, to the next day, from the previous day to the next day, and the difficulty with managing emotions, they predict suicidal thoughts. That's what separates, even when you take into account existing depression and all of the other things that contribute to that, it's specifically insomnia, finding it difficult to go off to sleep and then being woken up by intense dreaming that predicts people having suicidal thoughts. Now, with the, the reoccurring nightmares that, that we see in post-traumatic stress disorder, they also have a connection with suicide, but what they predict in particular is suicide attempts. Even when you take into account the intrusive thoughts and flashbacks and all the rest of it, what separates out that group of people with a, a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis that act upon um, suicidal thoughts to attempt suicide and those who don't is the, is the reoccurring nightmares. And that's true with other, other serious, serious conditions as well, like borderline personality disorder, which you, you and your listeners will know if you've worked with people who have that diagnosis or you know people who are affected by it has huge overlaps with anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder and so on too. That's what insomnia and reoccurring nightmares predict. Okay. So some of the things that might be happening then, so, so what you're saying is people waking, the intermittent waking or, or the waking up in the middle of the night, not being able to go back to sleep is mm -hmm. excessive REM and therefore your brain has been pulled out of sleep. Mm -hmm. so why does that happen? It would seem that the level of, a, to do with the level of arousal, it's as if you've suddenly, your security officer perceives some kind of a threat and, and just wakes you up. You're just unable to stay asleep any longer because you're so emotionally aroused. Yeah, because you've got that, you know, you're on alert, you're basically in a, a fight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly that. Okay. Yeah. So if somebody's struggling to fall asleep or if somebody does find themselves awake and, and struggling to go back to sleep, what can they do to help? Well, from a human givens perspective, the ultimate kind of solution to any of these sorts of issues is addressing unmet needs. But then we need to look at what the barriers are to the person being able to address those needs. So if they're, they're laying awake worrying about their finances or, you know, going to a job the next day that where they're, you know, they don't like it because it's not meaningful or there's bullying going on in the workplace or they're worrying about a relationship issue, then ultimately the, the solution is to, to address those particular issues. Now, those are environmental barriers to meeting needs, but of course, our resources may be harmed or misused in some way. So if we are misusing our imagination to worry lots or giving attention to things that we can't resolve then and there, then it can be helpful to recognize that. And a couple of things that I will often recommend are things like, and I'm sure, again, this is common to other human givens practitioners, are things like getting up and doing boring tasks for periods of time so those sorts of behavioral interventions but also writing things down as well so creating lists of what our concerns are and I, I always I'm always quite specific about this I always say that they should write them down with a notepad and there are two reasons for that one is is that you wouldn't possibly have your phone beside your bed if you've got sleep issues because that would be a barrier <laughs> to you going off to sleep and the second reason is is that 90 percent of us are right-handed the right hand is guided by the left neocortex and the left neocortex is much much better at dampening down emotional arousal which is you know um why some of us if we're trying to concentrate sitting in a meeting or a lecture or something like that we may find ourselves doodling because it just helps to calm, calm ourselves down so writing down those lists and parking them and acknowledging that you can't resolve it there and then say you're going to deal with it after you've gone off to sleep the next day and I think that's very useful. Also, something that Joe Griffin has said a few times, which I think is super important as sleep becomes more of a pressing issue, is that we need to have a, a slightly more relaxed and kind of chilled out attitude about it. Worrying about not going off to sleep is like the best way to stop yourself going off to sleep. So just kind of adopting an attitude of, well, you know, I'm going to lay in bed and rest and just relax. And if I go off to sleep, I do. And if I don't, then I'm at least in bed relaxing and kind of and, and resting and that's that's good for me too and that gets rid of or helps to sort of calm down those expectations that may be getting in the way of us going off to sleep and that are just further arousing the security officer 
Absolutely. And that's why one of the things I always say is, you know, just have your mobile phone on the other side. If you have to have it in your room, have it on the other side of the room, face down so that you can't just grab it. You can't clock watch in the middle of the night, because as soon as you've done that, you've lit your brain up and you've, you know, you're less likely to be able to go back to sleep. Exactly that. And get old fashioned alarm clocks as well. I always kind of recommend that too. I think there ought to be a, there ought to be people buying more of those and investing in them as well now the other thing of course so the, that sort of advice is around um how we organize sleep and how we use our resources in in a more in a healthier and more sensible way and an, another really key point around that is making sure that we have regular going to bed times in a routine that leads up to going off to sleep because the research seems to suggest that the number one thing that promotes healthy sleep is having a regular going to bed and getting up time as well i have um i had a client who severe long-standing mental health problems and what they'd done to make that to ensure that that would happen is that they had an alarm clock that would only switch off when they got up out of bed which is often a struggle for them went downstairs and took a photo of their microwave and then the alarm would switch off that that's that's fairly brutal but it worked it really worked for her so those are things around kind of using our resources in a in a more sensible way and things like learning relaxation exercises 7 11 breathing to calm the security officer down no doubt help as well and then of course the, the third barrier is harm to our resources so if we are suffering with intrusive thoughts nightmares flashbacks the symptoms of trauma they can be quite dramatic like that or just you know kind of low-lying or kind of sub-threshold traumas as well then abs- if it's you or, or somebody that you're supporting or that you care about then absolutely encourage them to see somebody that is skilled at treating trauma and we would recommend the rewind technique because of the safety protocols that are built into it and because it involves using the the natural resources like dissociation and the relaxation response and visualization to help us process traumas that may be interrupting our sleep and giving rise to reoccurring nightmares as well. Mm. So one of the things that, you know, you've talked about too little REM being a really key component of both suicidal thoughts and and people carrying out with suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. You also talked about anxiety and self-harm as well. And so really sort of increasing our risk for that because the amygdala is on alert and our cortex or our thinking areas of our brain are, are not able to regulate them. So what might we see presenting with clients suffering like that? Yeah. Okay. So there's a kind of a long-standing relationship between self-harm and suicide, which researchers and people working in mental health services recognize. But it's worth unpacking what that relationship is a little bit, at least what the research seems to suggest. So most self-harming seems to start around about the age of 12 or 13. Um, it can we, we tend to associate it with people in in adolescence because most people that have self-harmed discontinue it as they grow older and they learn alternative coping strategies that isn't to say that it stops altogether though because it's also true that that some people continue using self-harm as a coping strategy into the later stages of their life but become more competent at disguising it yeah. there's um, so many right. different ways that people can self-harm and right well. Absolutely that. Absolutely that. And what the research shows is that it's certainly not a cry for attention. That idea is is debunked by by the research completely. And in, in at least 70 percent of cases, it's really about the need for control. It's about getting control over distressing thoughts and feelings. Mm-hmm. And so we can see immediately that if somebody is suffering with insomnia or recurring nightmares and they've got negative emotions carrying over from the previous day, and they're finding it more difficult to manage those negative feelings and negative emotions because the thinking parts of the brain are weakened by not having enough REM sleep to calm them down as well, then that makes impulsivity more likely. And that's what the research shows adolescents and teenagers, adults too, but adolescents and teenagers that don't get enough REM sleep, they're more impulsive the next day. So they're more likely to engage in risk-taking behavior. They're more likely to resort to forms of self-harm, whether that's the sort of dramatic forms that we think think of things like you know cutting and burning of the skin but also you know using alcohol or punching balls or whatever it is to get some kind of temporary relief from and control over distressing thoughts and feelings because those sorts of things are 
releasing the body's natural painkillers, anesthetics and what have you, and completing expectation cycles to kind of reduce levels of cortisol too. Now, the connection between that and suicide is twofold. What one is that sometimes there's unintended suicide as a consequence of self-harm. So it's, in other words, it's accidental. But the research also shows that if a person persists in self-harming behavior, if they, in other words, if they become reliant upon it, a part of their brain learns that the way to get control over distressing thoughts and feelings is to self-harm in order to release anesthetics and endorphins and what have you, then it, they can get stuck in a cycle where they feel stress or distress that triggers the impulse to self-harm, they self-harm. And then they feel some temporary relief, but then shortly after that, feel terrible about the fact that they've self-harmed and that triggers low feelings of low self-esteem, low self-worth and what have you. And that is connected both with getting stuck in a cycle of self-harm, but also with suicide. It would seem that after 10 periods of having relied upon self-harming behavior to get control over distressing feelings and thoughts, that we cross a threshold. And it's then when the, the low self-esteem that is attached to self-harm, which may also be con connected to body image and that kind of a thing, or other people seeing cuts or, or scars, at that 10 episode threshold, that it increases the risk of people then having suicidal thoughts and the risk of them acting on that suicide, those suicidal thoughts goes up too. So the, and the connection with REM sleep, of course, is that if you're not getting enough REM sleep to discharge negative emotions in the previous day, and allow the parts of the brain that are involved with managing emotions to, to rest and come back online, then the risk of impulsivity increases. That makes so much sense. Um, and a bit of a, a, a light bulb moment for, for me there with something. But, you know, how do we know that we're getting the right amount of sleep? How do we know that we're getting the right amount of REM? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know so many people where these, you know, they have these wearable trackers, which are not massively accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and in my experience of working with people actually contribute to the anxiety around their sleep, you know, that they've seen, oh, I've only got such and such. And it says that I've only mm -hmm. had this amount of REM. How do we actually know? And can we know? Well, I, I think there is an answer to this. And but I'm afraid it doesn't involve wearing kind of health tech wear and what have you, which I'm very interested in, by the way. And I know people personally who, who are involved and have done really great projects with that kind of a thing but they're using really expensive kind of high-tech kit not the kind of thing that you can you know buy online if you're yeah. not working in, in that kind of an industry however to, to my mind the best way of knowing whether you've had enough REM sleep is to notice how you feel when you wake up the next day and if you wake up feeling reasonably refreshed and sort of maybe a little bit sleepy but not tired mm -hmm. then it's done the job is when we wake up feeling tired the next day or when we're still feeling aroused and wired the next day, that, that tells us that we, we need to have a think about addressing unmet needs and put some attention into, you know, good sleep practices and maybe going to see somebody if we're, you know, if there are some unresolved worries, concerns and intrusive thoughts that we are struggling to get on top of. It's always how we feel the next day. I kind of liken this a little bit to our strategy around, in, uh, around encouraging people to drink enough water to stay hydrated. Like in the UK, it's um, you know, the government guidelines say that everybody should drink you know, two litres every day, regardless of what your physical size and shape and gender is. Or the um, amount of activity that you're doing. Or the amount of activity that you've done. Whereas in Australia, they have a much more sensible approach. They have urine charts on the back of every toilet door that encourage you to pay attention to the colour of your urine, because that's nature telling you. Mm. Like, is that There's the evidence, like whether if it's, you know, reasonably clear you know you're reasonably hydrated but if it's not then you need to do something right now because you know in a, in a climate like in australia it could be a matter of life and death in certain parts of that country and so i think we need to be paying attention to what nature is is telling us and learning learning how to be more in tune with that not worry too much about it but just sort of sync up a little bit and have a better relationship with what our our, our bodies and brains are telling us yeah, we seem to have become very detached from from ourselves, you know, and increasingly so increasingly reliant on, you know, media and tech to be uh, guiding us as to mm. what's the right thing to do. But it makes complete sense, you know, just to actually tune into the natural body and to be really listening to what that body's saying. Yeah, I think so. The other thing that I'd like to share with you, Joe, is that something that I've recently been in the habit of doing when I'm working with 
clients, particularly if they have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, um, which is also some, depending on what manual the psychiatrist is using, also called um, emotionally unstable personality disorder. And these are people who find it really difficult to regulate and manage emotions. They're more likely to experience suicidal thoughts and more likely to act upon them, more likely to struggle with relationships, more likely to resort to self-harming as well. And they're often stigmatized by uh, mental health professionals and psychiatrists and seen as difficult to work with and challenging. And often there are a number of things in their past which contribute to this difficulty with regulating emotions and mood swings and volatility and angry outbursts and all that kind of thing. And they're also one of the kind of the, the things which is largely ignored by, I mean, if you read the NICE guidelines, for example, they acknowledge that people with this diagnosis are likely to suffer with insomnia, but they, they say it's not, it's not a core part of that particular diagnosis. And yet insomnia affects everybody with that diagnosis. And as many as 50% of them also suffer with reoccurring nightmares as well. And there's some, there's some recent research that shows that it's disordered sleep in childhood and reoccurring nightmares that can predict people going on to develop the, the symptoms associated with this diagnosis as early as kind of 11 and 12. And the other challenge that I found working with people with that particular diagnosis, it's very difficult for them to stay in a calm state. So you, a prerequisite for treating trauma using the rewind technique is you have to be able to help people to get into and maintain a low level of physical and emotional arousal. That's really, really challenging. And they may, you know, there may be some, for, you know, some logical reasons for that. It may be that they don't, you know, they, um, they've had negative experiences of the mental health system. So they're not in a hurry to calm down when they're around you as if you're, if you're a mental health professional. And it may also be that, you know, you help them to get into a calm, relaxed state to begin with, but then there are, you know, you'll see flashes of anxiety across their face as well. And, and you have, you using the, the technical jargon, and I know that, know that we're going to unpack this, they have ab reactions. In other words, there are, there are things which are, are matches for previous experiences that they've had, which are coded with a high degree of anxiety. And they'll go from being in a very calm state one moment to being very, to being hyper anxious the next. And where that's the case, where it takes more time to build up a working relationship with them and to get them accustomed to you know, feeling relaxed around you and being able to engage in guided imagery, they're still at risk of experiencing suicidal thoughts. So where that's happened, if I'm, if, you know, if I'm just meeting up with somebody for the, the first time at the beginning of a session and we're you know, establishing rapport and I've, I'm asking about what's been going on for them since we last met, if they disclose and tell me I've been having suicidal thoughts, um, then I will, I'll, as well as asking them, you know, whether they have a plan to act upon them, which is, you know, an important part of, of staying safe when you're working with those people or working with anybody that's experiencing suicidal thoughts for that matter. I will also, and this has to be handled with sensitivity, you need to do this gently. I'll also ask them, can I ask you what your sleep was like the night before the suicidal thoughts? And when they when they're able to remember and most of the time they can because people know when when their sleep has been rubbish they'll say it, it was dreadful and you know i really struggled to get to sleep or i woke up and i was having nightmares again because i've been thinking about such and such a thing and there had been some other issue in their lives the day before that they'd not felt much control over i'm able to then say if our sleep's not terribly good and we're not getting enough dream sleep to calm the brain down sometimes the negative emotions from the previous day can give rise to suicidal thoughts. Do you think that that might be what happened on that particular day? And they'll think about it for a moment. And they'll, then if, if they agree that it makes sense, you can see that it takes some of the heat out of the suicidal thoughts. It sort of reframes them as something for which there's some kind of logical sense for rather than a kind of, you know, an impulse to end your life. And it takes some of the fear out of it for them as well. And although I'm in the early stages of doing that, because this is a re kind of re relatively new kind of synthesizing of research and integrating it with human givens ideas, um, my hope is, is that over time, when people are able to remember that, they'll be able to check in with themselves and say, okay, I've had some suicide thoughts, but that's because my sleep was rubbish last night. It's not because I want to end my life. And they'll have control over that process that, and that experience, which is informed by research and is a helpful reframe for them. 
so so useful so helpful to know and you know such a, a helpful thing to be able to share with the client so that they've mm-hmm. got the control over that so what about other anxiety disorders such as OCD? So there is research that shows that there is a link between insomnia and disrupted REM and OCD, but particularly when obsessive compulsive disorder takes a form of obsessive thoughts, what is sometimes referred to as pure O. And what the research shows is that while that it's almost like a cycle. So while the person may be laying awake with intrusive thoughts, the obsessive thoughts going over and over again in their mind, that will prevent them from going off to sleep. And as you know, as we've said, that results in negative emotions, which are kind of driving those, that, that rumination being carried over to the previous day, but also difficulty with regulating and managing emotion and thought the next day. So it's as if the rumination prevents the person getting enough REM sleep to manage emotions and thoughts. And then they wake up with less ability to manage the negative emotions and thoughts the next day. And that can increase the severity of the obsessive thoughts and make it more difficult to manage. Particularly, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're listening, if you're a therapist or a practitioner, or, you know, you're caring for somebody or you yourself are affected by OCD, it's really important to address and improve sleep to reduce the severity of the obsessive thoughts. And I'd go so far as to say that, you know, certainly if you're a therapist, Absolutely, we should be doing all of the things that we know can help people with OCD, you know, framing the the obsessive thoughts as bullies, addressing any traumas that may be giving rise to um, the obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviours, but also addressing insomnia that may be exacerbating the symptoms and getting in the way of the person recovering and from obsessive thoughts. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so important across the board, isn't it? And my understanding is that there isn't a, a single new entry in the DSM over the last 20 years that doesn't have sleep as part of the problem. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely that. And this is perhaps for another time, perhaps we'll do another podcast in the future, Joanna, but it might even be that the whole spectrum of uh, symptoms right the way across the mental health continuum can be better understood as having a relationship with either too much REM sleep or too little REM sleep. And that sort of leads me on to think about other other things that might impair REM, mm. you know, things like excessive alcohol consumption or, yeah. you know, taking substances. Yes. Does that impact on, does that decrease the amount absolutely. of REM? Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. That, that's absolutely right. So in ge- generally speaking, depressant substances, whether they're illegal drugs or legal prescription drugs, inhibit REM. So cannabis for example will inhibit REM sleep I learned this a a long time ago I spent a long time working with in young offenders institutes and working with young men who would come into custody custodial settings where they have they may have less access to cannabis and than they would ordinarily have had before you know going to prison and also you know growing up my peer group was you know cannabis use was rife in my peer group so I've got a lot of personal experience of this too And what you see is that when people have less access to cannabis, either because because they don't have any choice over it or because they're choosing to abstain from cannabis as part of recovering from addiction to substances or because or maybe because they've been using cannabis to manage the symptoms of trauma or of psychosis. That's incredibly common, too. What you will see is a rebound. If going back to when we were talking a short while ago, Joe, we, we talked about four things. One is that a carrying over of negative emotions from the previous day, the second being the security officer in the brain being um, more sensitive, the third being that the thinking part of the brain is less practiced at re- or less able to regulate emotions, and then the fourth thing is a REM sleep rebound. So what you'll see is when people come off cannabis or they discontinue using alcohol or opioids like heroin or, or other prescription drugs, you'll see that REM sleep rebound. You'll, certainly, you'll see the return of vivid, vivid dreaming. Yeah. And also less ability to regulate and manage emotion because they've been relying upon other substances to do that for them. That's also the case with, um, you'll also see a suppression of REM sleep, people not having enough REM sleep if they're using long-term antidepressants, particularly not every antidepressant acts on REM sleep, but serotonergic ones, the most commonly prescribed ones certainly do. And we've known that since the late 70s, early 80s, it's been confirmed and replicated in multiple studies but is largely ignored and not known about 
So are you talking about SSRIs here? Talking about SSRIs, absolutely that. Also MOAIs, uh, which are less often, and tricyclics, which are less often prescribed, supposedly. That, that's what the statistics seem to show. But nonetheless, they, they all act in one way or another to suppress REM sleep. And actually, that's their, their mechanism of effect when they do provide people with relief from waking up feeling exhausted the next day because they've been doing so much dreaming. However, if you stop, if you're taking them over a long period of time or you're on a heavy dosage and it stops REM sleep from doing the job of discharging negative emotions in the previous day and from allowing the thinking parts of the brain to be calmed down as well, which is why you have the side effects, the feelings of anxiety, suicidal thoughts in some cases, a general feeling of numbness or a difficulty with being able to think and plan ahead. That's all the result of suppressing REM sleep. Mm. And I think it's something that as, as therapists, we've, we've seen mm-hmm. for a long, long time. Yes. But it's only sort of more, more recently that people are really starting to talk about it. And I think there was some research published earlier this year, um, wasn't there, that sent out? Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Absolutely that. Also, benzodiazepines as well suppress REM sleep too. So they're often prescribed as sleep medication, but they have unintended consequences, which can be, which are what you would expect to see if if somebody is not having sufficient REM sleep, is REM, if REM sleep is being prevented from playing its really important role of calming the brain down and discharging negative emotions in the previous day. Yeah, I was going to ask about, you know, so-called sleeping pills, um, mm. prescription sleeping pills, you know, I know what I think about this, but, you know, do, do they help? Do they hinder? Are you actually getting the right stages of sleep when you, you take a sleeping pill? What happens there? Well, you know, my view is that, you know, dreaming REM sleep evolved over, over you know, millennia. We know that other mammals and that birds too dream too. So we're talking about a long-standing evolutionary mechanism for keeping us healthy for discharging negative emotional arousal and then allowing the body to kind of calm down enough to go into deep sleep to repair the body too so anything that we do to sort of tinker with that system without a complete understanding of it I think we're I think you know we're at risk of uh, unintended consequences and of, um, of doing harm so I would always advise people to you know learn about learn about the importance of emotional and physical needs, learn how to identify which needs are not being met, learn healthy strategies for calming, calming down and getting a handle on difficult feelings and, and promoting sleep and healthy diet and exercise and what have you. They should always be the first port of call and going to see somebody that's competent at treating trauma, ideally using the rewind technique. Mm -hmm. So it really seems that the approach people should be taking is, you know, a a multifaceted approach that we can't really treat, you know, mental health and and emotional well-being without addressing sleep. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. There was a video, I think I think it's still out there of of, um, Joe Griffin, um, one of the co-founders of the Human Givens Approach, talking about the the need for a mental health science and any any science has is founded on kind of basic principles things that we we all agree and the first the first law if you like if there were if there were agreed laws about a a mental health science is that we can't be unwell if our if our physical and emotional needs are met that mental health mental ill health and addictions vacate the picture but he also then goes on to say that this understanding about REM sleep is like a, a diamond with with many faces and as you turn it and you look through the diamond in different ways it shines light in different ways and helps us to understand many more things about mental health but my suspicion is about physical health too so protecting sleep and learning as much as we can about REM sleep and not ignoring the fact that the human givens approach has this this powerful idea at its heart I think is going to bear fruit for people for many years to come Mm. I think it's something that until more recently has been widely ignored. Um, certainly the culture of, you know, working more and more increasing productivity, which was, you know, actually decreasing um, everything. Yeah. 
everybody you know and, and I, I think hopefully that that's starting to turn now and we're starting to see people more aware of the the importance of of sleep and of all the stages of sleep yes you know, and how they're all absolutely vital for, for our, our, our emotional and our physical well-being and it's certainly something that we need to be paying more attention to I really think so too well, that's all we've got time for today. But if you'd like to find out more about Ezra's work, he's written a really insightful article in the latest issue of the Human Givens Journal. We'll include a link to get hold of your copy in the podcast description. You can also find out lots of information about sleep and dreaming and mental health, including two free online courses on the Human Givens website. So thank you again, Ezra, for covering such an important topic today. I know that your knowledge and advice has been so invaluable to our thank listeners. You. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Until next time, goodbye.